Now, on HistoryRadio.org, Sylvia Pankhurst describes a 1906 suffragette protest in the British Parliament. The songs you hear at the start and at the end of the program, are contemporary Edison recordings. Hello Mr. Harrigan. How are you Alderman? What's going on here tonight? Why is it a suffragette meeting? We demand the ballot! Home is where the husband is, be it near or be it far. Office, theatre, pullman car, pool room, polls or corner bar. All good wives, remember this, home is where the husband is. Women's place is home, I whiz. Leave your family bacon frying, leave your wash and dishes drying, leave your little children crying, join your husband, near or far, at the club or corner bar, for the court has taught us this, home is where the husband is. Alice Dewar Miller All the women, how to win them, tell us pray. That's in our time rather dim in, for there is no fattened way. Winning women, winning women, for the lovers, how it's done. That's what nobody discovers, not even an editor. With one you have to flirt and flatter, so and so and so and so and so. And look unutterably at her, so and so and so and so. And other likes you when you bless her, so and so and so and so. While you beat her, you can trust her so and so and so and so. One ass for tenderness and flagging so and so and so and so. And others always ragging, nagging so and so and so and so. Another likes incessant laughter. Ha 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 ha. On October 3, 1906, Parliament reassembled for the autumn session. A large number of our women made their way to the House of Commons on that day, but the government had again given orders that only twenty women at a time were to be allowed in the lobby. All women of the working class were rigorously excluded. My mother and Mrs. Pethick Lawrence were amongst those who succeeded in gaining entrance. They at once sent in for the chief liberal whip and requested him to ask the Prime Minister, on their behalf, whether he proposed to do anything to enfranchise the women of the country during the session either by including the registration of qualified women in the provisions of the plural voting bill then before the house or by any other means the liberal whip soon returned with a refusal from the government to hold out the very faintest hope that the vote would be given women at any time during their term of office on hearing this mrs pankhurst and mrs pethick lawrence returned to their comrades and consulted with them the women had received a direct rebuff and they felt that they must now act in such a way as to prove that the suffragettes would no longer quietly submit to this perpetual ignoring of their claims they therefore decided to hold a meeting of protest not outside in the street but just there in the lobby of the house of commons of all places the most effective one for women to choose for a meeting because the nearest within their reach to that legislative chamber which had so frequently refused to grant them the franchise once made, the resolution was acted upon without delay. Mary Gawthorpe mounted one of the settees close to the statue of Sir Strafford Northcote and began to address the crowd of visitors who were waiting to interview various members of Parliament. The other women closed up around her, but in the twinkling of an eye dozens of policemen sprang forward, tore the tiny creature from her post and swiftly rushed her out of the lobby instantly mrs despard a sister of general french a tall ascetic-looking grey-haired figure stepped into the breach but she was also roughly dragged away then followed mrs cobden sanderson a daughter of richard cobden and many others but each in her turn was thrust outside and the order was given to clear the lobby mrs pankhurst was thrown to the ground in the outer entrance hall and many of the women thinking that she was seriously hurt closed round her refusing to leave her side crowds were now collecting in the roadway and the woman who had been flung out of the house attempted to address them but were hurled away annie kenny who had scarcely recovered from the effects of her last imprisonment had been told by the committee that she must not take part in the demonstration for fear that she should again be arrested she agreed to run no risks but she could not keep entirely away from the scene of action and standing on the other side of the road was now watching to see what might befall her comrades in the midst of the struggle she noticed that mrs pethick lawrence was being roughly handled and impulsively ran forward to ask her if she were hurt being already well known to the police she was immediately arrested 
mrs lawrence was greatly distressed and cried out you shall not take this girl she has done nothing but the only result of her protest was that she herself was also taken into custody before long seven women had shared the same fate including miss irene miller my sister adela pankhurst and mrs howe martin b s c who had recently become honorary secretary of the london committee of the women's social and political union meanwhile some of the poor women who had marched from the east end and who had been denied admission to the lobby were resting their tired limbs on the stone benches in the long entrance hall and after mrs cobden sanderson had made her attempt to speak and had been hustled away she seated herself quietly beside these women and began to talk with them shortly afterwards a young policeman came up and abruptly ordered her away and as she did not go he seized her and dragged her to the police station the next morning the women were brought up at rochester row police court before mr horace smith mrs cobden sanderson's sisters mrs cobden unwin and mrs cobden sickert and several friends and relatives of the other women had come early in order that they might be sure of obtaining a seat in court whilst another trial was in progress the usher had asked them to leave the court for the present in order to make room for other people saying you shall be allowed in again when your own case comes on they at once acceded to his request but were prevented from returning and were subsequently told that no women would be allowed to enter some twenty or thirty of us had by this time congregated in the large entrance hall but though men were constantly passing in and out of the court where the trial was taking place admittance was denied to us many of us wished to testify as witnesses but we were told that we could not go into the court and were taken into a side room where an attempt was made to lock us in to prevent this we insisted upon standing in the doorway in the meantime the case against the ten suffragists was being hurried through they were all put into the dock together after the police evidence had been heard against them mrs cobden sanderson asked leave to make a statement you must not picture her to yourself as being either big-boned plain-looking and aggressive and wearing mannish clothes or as emotional and overstrung on the contrary she is just what reynolds hobner sir henry raeburn or romney with his softest and tenderest touch would have loved to paint not very tall she is comfortably and firmly knit and as she walks she puts her foot down quite firmly in a dignified and stately way she is always dressed in low-toned greys and lilacs and her clothes are gracefully and delicately wrought with all sorts of tiny tuckings and finishings which give a suggestion of daintiest detail without any loss of simplicity or breadth she has a shower of hair like spun silver that crinkles itself in the most original and charming way and which she binds around with broad ribbon lest its loose falling strands should mar the neatness of her aspect her cheeks are tinged with a soft dull rose that one sees in pastel and her eyes have the most genial and benevolent glance speaking now to the magistrate she said quite quietly that she had gone to the house of commons to demand the vote that so long as women were deprived of citizen rights and had therefore no constitutional means of obtaining redress they had a right to be heard in the house of commons itself she wished to take the whole responsibility of the demonstration upon her own shoulders if any one is guilty she said it is i i was arrested as one of the ringleaders and being the eldest of these i was most responsible then she quoted in her defence the words of mr john burns who was now the president of the local government board and who in circumstances similar to those in which she was placed had said i am a rebel because i am an outlaw i am a law-breaker because i desire to be a law-maker at this point the magistrate who had repeatedly interrupted her refused to hear any more or to allow any statement at all from the other prisoners although in doing so he was disregarding every legal precedent he said that each of the ten defendants must enter into her own recognizances to keep the peace for six months and must find a surety for her good behaviour in ten pounds and that if she failed to do this she must go to prison for two months in the second division the women at once protested against this mockery of a trial and raising a banner bearing the words women should vote for the laws they obey and the taxes they pay declared that they would not leave the dock until they had been allowed the right to which all prisoners were entitled namely that of making a statement in their own defence but mr horace smith cared nothing for the justice of what they said he merely called the police and the women were forcibly removed the police court authorities now announced to those of us who were waiting in the witness-room that the case was over and that our friends had been taken to holloway 
i can scarcely express our feelings of indignation it seemed indeed terrible that ten upright earnest women should have been thus hustled off to prison without a word from their friends after a trial lasting less than half an hour some protesting others filled with silent consternation the women turned to go but i myself felt that i could not leave without a single word of rebuke to those who had conducted the proceedings against us so shamefully i therefore returned to the door of the inner court and asked to be admitted it is all over said the doorkeepers there is nothing to interest you now but i walked quickly past them and entered the court it was quite a small room one could easily make oneself heard without raising one's voice and as shortly as i could i told the magistrate how women had been refused admittance whilst the trial was in progress and how some who had actually taken their seats had been tricked into leaving i pointed out to him that it was customary to allow the general public and especially friends of the prisoners to be present in court it was grossly unfair to refuse to do so in this case and likely to destroy confidence in the justice of the trial i was explaining that even the women who had wished to testify as voluntary witnesses had been kept out of the court when the magistrate interrupted me saying there is no truth in any of your statements the court was crowded i was then seized by two policemen dragged across the outer lobby and flung into the street here a great mass of people had assembled and i felt that i ought not to go away without telling them something of the cause for which we were fighting and of the very scanty justice which had been doled out to our women i tried to speak to them though i had been rendered almost breathless by the violent manner of my ejection and only to those who were near me could i make myself heard in a moment i hardly knew how or why i was again seized by the policeman and dragged back into the court-house soon afterwards i found myself in the dock before mr horace smith and was charged with causing an obstruction and with the use of violent and abusive language i protested against the latter half of the charge and it was immediately withdrawn at greater length than on the first occasion i was then able to describe all that had happened within the precincts of the court many of our friends and members on hearing that all was not over had returned and from amongst them i called as witnesses to the truth of my statement mrs cobden unwin mrs cobden sickert and a number of other ladies but their testimony was ignored and i was found guilty and sentenced either to pay a fine of one pound or to undergo fourteen days imprisonment in the third and lowest class of course i chose the latter alternative and was taken to join my comrades in the cells but now instead of being ordered away as before our friends were allowed to come up and bring us lunch and talk to us for a little while the police court cells were small and dark furnished only with a wooden seat fastened to the wall and a sanitary convenience the walls were whitewashed the floors were of stone and each of the cells opened into a long stone passage whose barred windows overlooked the courtyard beyond which we could see through gaps in the prison buildings the crowds of people who were assembled in the street beyond we were not shut up in the cells but allowed to move about from one to another or to stand in the passage at the end of which were several stone steps leading up to a strongly fastened iron gate this passage though dimly lit was lighter than the cells and seemed to us less insanitary and so as we had many hours to wait before we were taken to holloway in the prison van black maria we seated ourselves together on the stone steps some one had brought with her a volume of browning and mrs lawrence read aloud to us from those of the poems which seemed to apply to our own case all too soon the order came for us to go down to the van and one by one as our names were called we walked across the yard climbed the steps and took our places separately in one of the twelve little compartments which it contained i was one of the two last to enter and i had therefore a little more of the fresh air than most of the others and from the small barred window of my compartment i could see the burly form of the guarding policeman who stood in the passageway between us and when he moved from time to time could see past him and out the barred window in the door of the van to the streets through which we drove how long the way seemed to holloway as the springless van rattled over the stones and constantly bumped us against the narrow wooden pens in which we sat as it passed down the poor streets the people cheered they always cheer the prison van it was evening when we arrived at our destination and the darkness was closing in as we passed in single file through the great gates we found ourselves at the end of a long corridor with cubicles on either side 
a woman officer in holland dress with a dark blue bonnet with hanging strings on her head and with a bundle of keys and chains jangling at her waist called out our names and the length of our sentences and locked each of us separately into one of the cubicles which were about four feet square and quite dark in the door of each cubicle was a little round glass spy-hole which might be closed by a metal flap on the outside mine had been left open by mistake and through it i could see a little of what was going on outside once we had been locked away the wardress came from door to door taking down further particulars as to the profession religion and so on of each prisoner there were many beside ourselves and asking if we and they could read and write and so meanwhile the prisoners called to each other over the tops of the cubicles in loud high-pitched voices every now and then the officer protested but still the noise continued soon another van-load of prisoners arrived and the cubicles being filled several women together were put into the same compartment sometimes as many as five in one of those tiny places it was very cold and the stone floor made one's feet colder still yet for a long time until i was so tired that i could no longer stand i was afraid to sit down because in the darkness one could not see whether as one feared everything might be covered with vermin after waiting a long time the prisoners were sent to see the doctor and we suffragists stood waiting in a line together the wardress passed constantly up and down our ranks saying all of you unfasten your chests when at last we got into the doctor's room he either asked us no questions or said in a mechanical way are you all right then he touched us quickly with his stethoscope and we passed back to our cubicles after another long wait we were sent to change our clothes in a large room lined with shelves with two or three wardresses hovering about and one seated at a table we were told to undress three or four at a time and given a short cotton chemise to put on after we had removed our own clothes then we were ordered to hand over our clothes hats dresses boots and all together which were roughly tied up in bundles and placed upon the shelves then barefooted and wearing only the chemise we were made to march across to the officer at the table the officer now told us to deliver to her our money jewellery hairpins and hair combs she gave us back the hairpins and kept everything else taking down particulars of these and entering them in a book at the same time she again asked us our names ages and the other particulars which we had now given so often after this we were searched the officer first telling us to put up our arms and then feeling us all over and examining our hair to see that we had nothing concealed about us a wardress then led us through a doorway into the dimly lit bathroom the baths were separated from each other by partitions and from the rest of the room by a half door which had no fastening and over which the wardress could look the baths were of black iron covered with an old and very dingy coat of white paint which had worn off in patches and the woodwork which enclosed them was stained and worn i shrank from entering the bath but i was shivering with cold and though i feared it was not clean there was something comforting about the feel of the warm water presently the wardress hung some towels and underclothing over the top of the wooden door and told me to dress as quickly as i could i hastened to obey her and found that the clothes which were badly sewn and badly cut were of coarse calico and harsh woollen stuff and that there were innumerable strings to fasten around one's waist a strange-looking pair of corsets was supplied to each of us but these we were not obliged to wear unless we wished the stockings were of harsh thick wool and had been badly darned they were black with red stripes going around the legs and as they were very wide and there were no garters or suspenders to keep them up they were constantly slipping down and wrinkling around one's ankles on opening my door i found that outside all was hurry and confusion in the dim light the women were scrambling for the dresses which were lying in big heaps on the floor the skirts of these dresses like the petticoats of which there were three were of the same width at both top and bottom and they were gathered into wide bands which though fastened with tapes were not made to draw up and had to be overlapped in the most clumsy fashion in order to make them fit any but the very stoutest women the bodices were so strangely cut that even when worn by very thin people they seemed bound to gape in front especially as they were fastened with only one button at the neck my bodice the only one i could manage to get hold of had several large rents which had been roughly cobbled together with black cotton every article of clothing was conspicuously stamped with the broad arrow which was painted black on light garments and white on those which were dark 
i had scarcely fastened my dress when somebody called out to us all look sharp and put on your shoes these we had to take for ourselves from where they were bundled together on a wooden rack none of them seemed to be in pairs and they were heavy and clumsy with leather laces that when one attempted to tie them broke easily in the hand lastly white cotton caps fastened under the chin with strings and stamped in black with the broad arrow and the blue and white check aprons and handkerchiefs both of which looked like dusters were given to us and we were led off on a long journey to the cells it seemed a sort of skeleton building that we were taken through the strangest place in which i had ever been in every great oblong ward or block through which we passed though there were many stories one could see right down to the basement and up to the lofty roof the stone floors of the corridors lined the walls all the way round jutting out at the junctions of the stories like shelves some nine or ten feet apart being protected on the outer edge by an iron wire trellis work four or five feet high and having on the wall side rows and rows and rows of numbered doors studded with nails the various stories were connected by flights of iron steps bordered by iron trellis work and reaching in slanting lines from corridor to corridor all the walls and doors were painted stone colour and all the ironwork was painted black we clattered up those seemingly endless flights and shuffled along those mazy corridors in our heavy shoes and at last stopped at a small office rather like one of the pay desks which one sees in drapers shops where our names and the length of our sentences and all the various other particulars were verified once more and the sheets for the bed a bible and a number of other little books with black shiny bindings were given out to us annie kenny had told us that a toothbrush would be given to us if we asked for it but that if we neglected to do this nothing would be said about it and we might not be allowed to have it later as we waited in line i noticed that the other women were eating chunks of brown bread but though by this time i was very hungry none had been given to me i asked mrs baldock who stood next to me where she had got her bread and she told me that one of the wardresses had given it to her and seeing that i had been overlooked she broke off half her own small loaf and gave it to me these were the last words i was to have with my fellow-prisoners for whilst they had been put into the second class i had been sentenced to the third and even in chapel they were hidden from me by a buttress after another long march through the prison corridors a wardress with her jangling keys unlocked a number of heavy iron doors and having ordered each of us to enter one of them separately shut them behind us again with a loud bang i now found myself in a small whitewashed cell twelve or thirteen feet long by seven feet wide and about nine feet high the floor was of stone the window which was high up near the ceiling had many little panes enclosed in a heavy iron framework and guarded by strong iron bars outside the iron door was studded with nails and its round eye-like spy-hole was now covered on the outside on the left-hand side of the door was a small recess some four feet from the ground in which behind a pane of thick opaque glass was a flickering gas jet which cast a dim light into the cell under this recess was a small wooden shelf somewhere about fourteen or fifteen inches square which i afterwards learnt was called the table and opposite this was a wooden stool by the window set into the corner of the room was another shelf about three feet six inches high with one about six inches from the floor immediately under it the lower shelf was for the mattress and bedding the upper one held a wooden spoon a pint pot of block tin stamped with the broad arrow a wooden salt cellar a small piece of hard yellow soap a red card case containing some prison rules and a card on which was printed a morning and evening prayer a small oval hairbrush without a handle like a good-sized nail-brush and a comb between three and four inches long on this shelf i was afterwards told to place my books and toothbrush these things had all to be kept in certain never varying positions on the floor leaning against the wall under the window were arranged a number of utensils made of block tin these being a plate a small water can holding about three pints of water a tiny shallow wash basin less than a foot in diameter and a small slop pail with a lid two little round brushes in shape rather like those we use for brushing clothes with which were intended for sweeping the floor a little tin dustpan and a piece of bath brick wrapped in some rags for cleaning the tins these were also placed in an order which as i soon learnt was never to be changed a small towel and a smaller tablecloth both of them resembling dishcloths hung on a nail propped against the right-hand wall was the plank bed with the pillow balanced on top 
the bed is i think two feet six inches in width and when in position for sleeping is raised up by two cross pieces to about two inches from the floor as i was examining in wonder all these various things a wardress opened the door and said sharply what have you not made your bed yet the light will be put out soon you had better make haste please can i have a night dress i asked but she answered no then the iron door banged and i was left alone for the night <laughs> i've been reading in the papers of a very funny land it's the land where the women wear the trousers where woman is the boss and poor old man is second hand in the land where the women wear the trousers he's got to stop at home all day while she goes out to work he's got to bath and wash the kids and mind he doesn't jerk he wears a flannel apron when she's toddling off to work in the land where the women wear the trousers in the land where the women wear the trousers who is it thinks the vote some use man man is often such a goose indeed it makes me laugh to see how men have struggled to be free poor washington who meant so well and nathan hale and william tell Hampton and Bolivar and Pym, and La Overture, remember him? And Garibaldi and Kossuth, and some who threw away their youth, all bitten by the stupid notion that liberty was worth emotion. They could not get it through their heads that if they stayed tucked up in beds, avoiding politics and strife, they'd lead a pleasant, peaceful life. Let us, dear sisters, never make such a ridiculous mistake but teach our children o'er and o'er that liberty is just a chore alice dewar miller you have just heard sylvia pankhurst's description of a 1906 suffragette protest in the british parliament the songs you heard at the start and at the end of the program were contemporary edison recordings This is HistoryRadio.org, a free radio stream, promoting knowledge of literature and history.